we're very pleased to have with us today um, Dr. Massimo Renzo, who's a reader uh, at King's College London, and uh, primarily works in the philosophy of war with a more general um, interest in <coughs> ethics and political philosophy, uh, from which this essay comes, and uh, he's going to talk to us today about consent and intentions. Great, thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks for having me. I'm really, I'm really happy to be here. I look forward to the discussion. So, the question that I address in the paper is the question of what it takes to give morally valid consent. It is a question that is sometimes uh, referred to as the question of the ontology of consent. And as I'm sure you know, this question has received significant attention in the news recently, primarily in relation to consent to sex. Following a number of high-profile cases of sexual harassment and sexual assault, was this uh, heated public debate that ensued in the media, with movements such as the Me Too movement or the Times Up movement, calling for, among, among other things, for new attention to the question of when someone can be said to have uh, given valid consent to sex. Now, the effects of this debate can hardly be assessed yet, but there are signs suggesting that we might be in the midst of a significant rethinking of the way in which consent to sex is normally understood. So Sweden, for example, is likely to introduce this coming July a law that will require explicit consent to sex, um, so consent that has to be communicated in advance uh, of sexual contact, and this is a requirement that many North American universities have already introduced in their campus codes. Now, I'm not going to address the legal question here of what the law should be like. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to discuss the moral question. And I think that in, ad addressing the moral question is, uh, you know, it's, it's necessary in order then to deal with the legal question. So in this paper, I just focus on the moral question. And the question, as I said, is when is it that we, one can be said to have given valid consent to sex? And or, or not exclusively to sex, though, part of the discussion will focus on consent to sex. So philosophers tend to disagree about, about the function of consent, about how consent uh, uh, works. What they agree on is what the point of consent is. Consent is a normative power that enables us to release others from obligations that they owe us. So by consenting uh, to you taking my laptop, what I do is I waive a claim right that correlate to obligation that other people have, an obligation not to take my lot. So philosophers agree about this much. What they disagree about is what do we need to do in order to exercise this normative power to weigh this claim uh, right that we have. There are three main views on the table. So the first view is the uh, what I call the mental state view. And this is the view according to which uh, I consent to you taking my laptop when I form a certain mental state. There are different candidates for what uh, should be the relevant mental state. For the purposes of this paper, I'll, I'll stick with this idea. So the relevant mental state is the mental state of waiving a right that I have that people don't take my laptop. So this is the mental state view. I consent when I form a certain mental state. Then there is, on the other end of the spectrum, the performative view, which is the view that says that I consent to you taking my laptop if I act in a certain way, or if I uh, utter certain words, or if I sign a form, if I perform the equivalent of a speech act. So here the focus is on what I do, rather than what's going on in my, in my head. Almost nobody defends this view in the philosophical debate. So Alan Wertheimer used to, but he has abandoned it since. I actually think that there's uh, more to be said for this view than most uh, philosophers uh, uh, believe, but I'm not going to cover this in the paper. I'm going to, uh, to talk about it in the present time if you'd like. So the real competitor uh, for, the, uh, for the mental state view is what I will call the mix, which is the view that says that when I consent to you taking my laptop, in order to consent to you taking my laptop, I have to do two things. I have to form a certain mental state, and then I have to communicate the mental state to you, or at least I have to attempt to communicate the mental state to you. Now, communication can be verbal or it can be nonverbal. 
But the important point is that forming a mental state is not enough to weigh the right that I have that you don't act in certain ways towards me. I also have to act and do something in order to communicate the mental state, or try to communicate uh, the mental state to you. Now, to be sure, defenders of the mental state view also acknowledge that communication is important for consent. But according to the mental state view, the role, of, the role that communication plays is merely to provide evidence of the fact that the relevant mental state has occurred. So, the magic of consent, as it were, happens when you form the mental state. That's when, by forming the mental state, you change a duty that the intended recipient of consent had not to act in certain ways into a permission. That's when the magic happens, as it were. And then when you communicate that, you just provide to the intended recipient of consent evidence of the fact that the normative change has already taken place. That's not what defenders of the mixed view uh, believe. They believe that the moral magic doesn't happen until you have communicated uh, the presence of the mental state. So, these, so the, the, the main two views that we'll discuss are the mental state view and the uh, and, uh, uh, mixed view. So how do we decide which view is, is, is the best view? So the debate so far has proceeded in a rather unsatisfactory way, uh, in my view. So there's an early literature on this topic from the mid-90s, early 2000s, and people working at the time were primarily relying on certain intuitions that would come up with a with a case that would support the mental state view and the case that would support the, uh, uh, the mixed view and they, most of the arguments seem to rely on this kind of trading of intuition. And then more recently, the, a number of philosophers have come up with, I think, more sophisticated accounts uh, of, of the ontology of consent. Um, and they, their ambition was not to rely exclusively on intuition. The strategy has been instead to Try and come up with an account of consent that um, coheres with how we treat other normative powers. So, for example, Tom Doherty in a recent paper has argued that well, since consent is the counterpoint to promising, so think about it, when you when you consent to someone acting in a certain way, you are you are transforming a previous duty that that person had into uh, a permission. Whereas, what happens when you promise? is that you turn an existing duty that you, sorry, an existing permission that you had into a duty. So Dorothy thinks consent is the counterpoint to promising, so we should expect the two normative powers to work more or less in the same way. Now, everybody agrees that promises require communication, so Dorothy concludes we should expect consent also to require communication. On the other hand, you have people like Larry Alexander and Kim Forzan who think about abandonment. And according to them, you can um, waive your property right of a certain object simply by forming a certain mental state. You don't need to communicate that. So if you leave uh, your, your, your uh, uh, sofa on the sidewalk and you don't need to tell anybody uh, that, you, that you intend to get rid of it, um, the mere fact that you form a certain mental state is enough for you to waive your right over the sofa. And so they say, well, why, why shouldn't we expect consent to work in the same way? Now, I find this uh, strategy positive. Because think about it, how should we decide whether we should follow Dorothy thinking that promising uh, works like consenting or whether we should follow Alexander and Forzani thinking that abandonment works like, uh, like consent. Um, it seems that Dorothy is already presupposing that consent needs to, needs to be communicated and that <coughs> Alexander and Forzani are already presupposing that uh, consent needs not, to, uh, need not to be communicated before they can conclude that we should treat consent like promising or that we should treat consent like abandonment. So the analogy has force only if you already believe that consent needs or to be communicated or not. So it seems to me that these uh, philosophers want to avoid relying exclusively on intuition, but 
it seems that ultimately the sort of argument that they offer also relies on this intuition. You already have to be on board in believing that consent needs to be communicated to follow Dorothy in thinking that consent works like promising. You already have to agree with Alexander and Ferdinand that consent needs not to be communicated to believe that it works like abandonment. So this strategy seems unhelpful unless we say something about why consent is relevantly similar to uh, promising or to abandonment. So, I want to offer an, uh, an alternative strategy, one that ties the question of the ontology of consent more closely to the question of the justification of consent. So, I think that to answer the question of how consent operates, we need to think about why we value having the normative power to consent. So, there's a connection between how the power operates and why we have the power to begin with. And I think this connection has been overlooked in the <coughs> philosophical <coughs> debate. And I guess the other thing that is driving me here is, that, is this thought that if we want to understand how consent operates, it might not be the best strategy to focus on the features of this practice or the features of this normative power that are in common with other normative powers. But a better strategy would be to look at what is distinctive about consent, features that um, uh, the practice of consent um, has that are not shared by promising or by abandonment or other uh, normative pa uh, powers authorizing or commanding and things like that. So one of these features is the fact that consent can be revoked. So that consent can be revoked marks a significant difference uh, with other normative powers, for example, promising. Promises cannot be revoked. Uh, the promisor can release the, uh, the promisee from the uh, promissory obligation, but the promisee, but the uh, promisee cannot um, um, cannot change the duty that the promisee has to act uh, uh, as required um, by the promise uh, she has made. So. I think an adequate account of the justification of consent will have to explain not only why we value having the power to waive certain rights, but also why we have the power to reacquire those rights under certain conditions. When you revoke your consent, you can require the right that you have originally uh, waived. And so, Similarly, our account of the ontology of consent will have to provide a convincing account of what it takes to give valid consent as well as to revoke it. So I want to think a little bit about how we should uh, understand this, um, uh, this element of consent, the fact that consent can be revoked. So there is a Philosophers haven't really talked much about this. Uh, there's a, a brief discussion of this, um, of this issue in a recent paper by Tom Doherty. So Doherty's view is that the conditions that need to be fulfilled in order to revoke consent are ident identical with the conditions that need to be fulfilled in order to give consent. So if forming a mental state is sufficient to give consent, then we should expect um, at this condition to be, uh, that we should expect that forming a certain mental state is sufficient to revoke consent. If some act of communication is required in addition to forming a mental state in order to give consent, we should expect the same to be true for revoking consent. And Dorothy thinks that this favors the mixed view. And, 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 and the reason why he thinks that is that if the mental state view was correct, then it would be very easy for us to become uh, wrongdoers in virtue of the fact that we act without, uh, without other people's consent, even if we cannot be reasonably expected to know that we are acting without other people's consent. So here's an example that I have in the paper. Suppose that um, Theo and Leslie are having consensual sex. Now, at T2, at one Theo and Leslie start having consensual sex. Then at T2, Leslie changes her mind and she forms the mental state associated with revoking consent. 
um, then at T3, Leslie will communicate to Theo that her mental state has changed. Suppose that it has to, sometimes has to pass between when she forms a mental state and when she uh, is able to finally communicate the, present, the change in her mental state. So if the mental state, if the, if the um, mental state view is correct, what happens here is that Leo, uh, Theo will be engaging in non-consensual sex between T2 and T3. So Theo will be a wrongdoer because he's acting, he's having sex with less with other consent between T2 and T3. Um, and that seems that's a, a theory that has this implication, we might think, is a theory that we should reject because it makes it too easy for people like Theo to become wrongdoers. We don't want a theory that makes it so easy for us to become wrongdoers. Now, if that's true, we should reject the mental state view as a view of what it takes to revoke consent. And if Dorothy is right that the conditions under, under we uh, give consent are identical with the conditions un under which we can revoke consent, then this also tells against adopting the mental state view as a view of what it takes to uh, give consent. Now, what could defenders of the mental state view say to resist this conclusion? So their standard move here is to distinguish between two questions. The question of whether someone is acting uh, impermissibly, because consent hasn't been uh, secured, and the question of whether someone should be blamed or whether someone is culpable for acting without someone else's consent. So what they would say in this case is that um, Theo is indeed responsible for engaging in non-consensual sex, but he is not culpable, we shouldn't blame Theo, because he couldn't reasonably expect him to <coughs> know that Leslie had changed our mental state. Now, I don't think that this strategy is going to work. I don't think that, I think that defenders of the traditional mental state view think that this distinction between permissibility and culpability can do more work than it actually, um, than it actually does. Um, it certainly doesn't work in this case, in my view, because we care not only about not being uh, blameworthy, we also care about not being wrongdoers. We care about not being wrongdoers, even if we are blameless wrongdoers. Our life goes worse if we are wrongdoers, if we engage in acts of wrongdoing, even if we cannot be blamed for those acts of wrongdoing. And if consent could be revoked simply by changing our mind without communicating, as the case of Leslie and Theo suggest, then it would be very easy for us to be turned into wrongdoers, although blameless ones. So, a traditional mental state view, I don't think, is able to handle this case. Um, I don't think that this is enough to accept the version of uh, the mixed view. Um, I think the mixed view has the same problem, in fact, has a more serious problem. So, I think once we, once we uh, further analyze uh, this sort of case, we'll see that the mental state view is actually a better place to deal with this sort of case. So to see what I mean, consider this variation on the, on the example I just gave you. So suppose that Theo <coughs> can tell whenever Leslie forms the mental state associated with revoking consent. So we can imagine, for example, that Leslie invariably blushes when she forms the mental state or when or she she blinks. And say, Theo and Leslie have known each other for a very long time. So Theo knows that if Leslie blushes, it can only mean that she has revoked her, she has formed the mental state associated with revoking her consent to sex. So now, at T2, Leslie changes her mental state and so blushes. Um, now, as in the previous case, suppose that Leslie cannot communicate to Theo that she has changed her mental state until T3. Notice that blushing is not a way of communicating that anything. 
So communication involves an entire a process of where the uh, speaker and the listener engage in a, in a kind of cooperative enterprise where they try to convey a certain message. Right? But this is a, the blushing in this case, it's just a physical reaction, it's like sweating. Right? If I see you sweating, I can tell that you might be hot, but you're not communicating, you're not intending to communicate to me that you're hot. I just can read the signs. I can read something that is happening to your body, but you are not intending to communicate that. Um, so, suppose that a T2 Leslie blushes, a T3 she then communicates to Theo that she has changed her mental state. Now it looks as if if you accept the communicative, if you accept that the conditions under which we give consent are identical with the conditions under which we revoke consent, and if you accept the, the, the mixed view, you would have to say that Theo is permitted to keep having sex with Leslie until T3, even if at T2, at T2 he has seen Leslie blush. So at T2 he knows that the mental state associated with revoking consent to sex is in place, it looks as if he's permitted to have, keep having sex with Leslie until T3, because only at T3 will Leslie be able to communicate uh, that she has changed her mental state. And that seems clearly wrong. It seems clear to me that it's at T2 that Theo should stop having sex with Leslie, it's impermissible to keep having sex with Leslie, and it's impermissible, in, impermissible because clearly it would be no consensual. If that's true, then it looks as if the conditions under which consent is revoked, the moment where, condition, the, where, where when consent is revoked is T2, and so forming a certain mental state is what it takes to revoke <coughs> consent. If we do believe that the conditions under which we revoke consent are identical with the conditions under which we uh, give consent, we should conclude that the mental state view is a better account of what it takes to give consent. So this is an argument based on, I think it's an, it's a, if it works, it's an interesting argument because it analyzes a feature which is distinctive of consent, is not shared by other uh, normative powers. But as I said, I think that before we can decide which uh, account of consent we should adopt, I think we need to look at a broader issue of why we value having the power to uh, consent. And so now I want to discuss this broader question, the question of the justification of consent. So, the question is, why do we value being able to change our normative relationship with others by way of consent? Here's an answer. We have the capacity to do that, to change our relation, normative relationship with others by exercising our power to consent because it is valuable in a particular way. It's the value of having this capacity that explains why we have this power. But plausibly, there is a connection between how the power operates and why we have the power to begin with. So if the existence of the power to change our normative relationship with others is explained by the fact that having such power enables us to perform some valuable function. It's only to be expected that the power will operate so as to facilitate the performance of this function. So we need to think about what the valuable function that the normative power to consent enables us to perform. What is this function? So, my view is that consent protects our capacity to exercise our autonomous agency. It enables us to exercise our autonomous agency by controlling which duties are owed to us. So having this kind of control, having the capacity to control the duties that other people owe us, is valuable because it increases our capacity to 
exercise our self-determining agency and shape our life as we wish. Now, if, if, if this is correct, it looks as if we have some reason to abandon at least some version of the mixed view, the classic version of the view according to which some sort of uptake is required in order to give consent. So, in order to consent, I need to communicate to you that I'm consenting to you taking my laptop or whatever, and you need to have understood that I'm the message that I'm trying to communicate to you. Why is that? Because if I could only consent provided that you understand the message that I'm trying to communicate to you, my power to change the duties that you have toward me is hostage to fortune. I can send you an email and say, you're welcome to use my laptop while I'm away, and then the email ends up in your spam folder, and you don't read the email, and now I am unable to change the duties that you have toward me. Or I tell you, yes, you can do this thing, you don't, you don't hear me, and because you don't hear me, I'm unable to change the duties that you have toward me. But if, if it's valuable for me that I get to change the duties that you have toward me, it looks as if the theory that makes it easier for me to change the duties that you have toward me is, is preferable. Now, the mental state view, is a view that makes it really easy for me to change the duties that others have toward me. All I have to do is to form a certain mental state. To be sure, if I consent to you hugging me, but you don't have access to this piece of information, having consented might not make it any more likely that I'll be able to enjoy the warmth of your hug. But the point of consent is not primarily to make it more likely that whatever interaction we consent to will happen. Um, indeed, not only consenting to you hugging me might not make it more likely that you will hug me. For example, if you have no interest whatsoever in hugging me, the fact that I consent is not going to make it any more likely that you will hug me. But there might be cases where consenting to uh, being hugged by, uh, by you will make it less likely that you will hug me. So perhaps you're a bully who enjoys hugging people only if they uh, don't give permission to being hugged. And so if I consent, if I consent to being hugged by you, that's going to make it less likely that you will hug me. Perhaps you'll hug Andrew instead. So the point of consent is not to control what other people do, but is to determine the normative status of what they do. The magic of consent consists in making it the case that I'm no wrong when you hug me, despite the fact that people are generally under a duty not to hug me. So, consent is not a tool to control what is done to us, it's rather a tool for controlling the moral status of what is done to us, namely to control whether what is done to us wrongs us or not. Later on I'll consider a qualification to this view, I think I want to weaken this view uh, to some extent. But this is a view that others have defended, for example, uh, my colleague David Owens that defends a version of this view. Now, suppose I'm right that the value of having the power to consent is explained by the, fast, the, by the fact that it enables us to have control over the duties that uh, others owe us. So as I've said, this gives us some reason to abandon um, one version of the mixed view, the one that requires uptake, that requires successful communication. But then we might think that there's a weaker version of the mixed view that could still be defended. And recently, Victor Tadros and Neil Manson have defended uh, version of, versions of, uh, of this view. So the idea is that consent requires an attempt to communicate. It's not, uh, it's not necessary that the message is understood by the intended recipient of consent, all that matters in order for consent uh, to be validly given is that there has been an attempt to communicate consent. Why is that? So let me discuss briefly, there's a longer discussion in the paper, but let me discuss just briefly uh, Tadros' argument, which I think is interesting. So Tadros 
offers a sophisticated argument for this view. So he says, we've seen that when I consent to you doing something, I release you from a duty. A duty that you previously had not to do that thing. Now, think about what the primary function of our duties is. The function is to constrain our practical reasoning. If you have a duty not to do X, that means then in deliberating how to act, there is a sense in which X is not an option for you. It would be inappropriate for you to see yourself as free to do X, even if there are some respects in which doing X would be valuable. So think about the classic case where a doctor could let a, uh, intentionally let a patient die so that she could use the organs to save other five people. There would be some value in saving five people, but what we mean when we say that the doctor has a duty not to let the patient die is that the fact that there would be some value in saving five people is something that the doctor is not allowed to include in her practical deliberation. So, but if the function of duty is, is to constrain our practical reasoning, when I consent to you doing X, what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm executing an intention to affect your practical reasoning. But now, it would be impossible, Tadros argues, for me to affect your practical reasoning, to change the role that doing X has in your practical reasoning without attempting to communicate that to you. I couldn't possibly do that. Now, given that I cannot intend to do something that I believe is impossible, I cannot intend to change the role that doing X has in your practical reasoning without attempting to communicate with you. So I cannot attempt to do something which is impossible, which is why I need to at least attempt to communicate to you that I'm, that I'm trying to change the duties that you have toward me. That's the argument. Now, I have a longer objection in the paper to Tadros's view, which discusses some of the details. I'm just going to, in the interest of time, I'm just going to present a, a simpler and broader objection, which is an objection to the idea that when I consent to you doing something, I am necessarily executing an intention to affect your practical reason. I'm not sure that that's always the case. So consider this scenario. So suppose I see you from a distance. I see that you're about to enter my house. You're about to enter my house without my permission. Um, Suppose I'm too far, I don't have the phone, I don't have your number, I cannot communicate with you, I cannot even attempt to communicate with you. I could, I could shout, but it would be a pointless attempt because you are too far. However, I don't want you to be a trespasser. I don't want you to be a trespasser because I don't want you to be a wrongdoer. I, I care about your soul. Most importantly, I don't want to be the victim of wrongdoing. It's bad for me, my life gets worse if I'm the victim of wrongdoing. So, I consent to you entering my house by forming the relevant mental state. The mental state of waiving my objection to you entering the house. Waiving my claim that you refrain from entering my house. So now when the police catches you, I can honestly say that you were not trespassing because I consented to you entering the house. The fact that I can do that gives me the capacity of preventing you from wronging me. And this is, this is valuable to me. See that, to me, the nature of your conduct in this case is different from what it would have been if you had entered my house. Suppose you entered the house, I don't, I don't even see you, then the police catch you, they bring you to me, I quickly realize what happens and I say, I lie and I say, oh yes, no, he had my permission to, um, to go in. It seems that in this case, I have been wronged by you, but I have sort of forgiven you and I've lied about having been wronged by you in order to avoid some bad consequences for you. But in the first case, the case where I see you and I form a certain mental state, it seems to me that in that case I haven't been wronged to begin with. 
I have suffered some wrong, and I'm going to come to that in a moment, but not the wrong of you entering the house without my permission. So if I'm right, this shows that I can change the normative status of your conduct without trying to affect your practical reasoning. I'm not trying to affect your practical reasoning in this case, but I'm still trying, I'm still effectively preventing you from wronging me. So when I think about this case, it seems to me that the mental state view has to be correct. Because I do think that that's a case of valid concern. And yet, when I think about this case, I think it's hard to shake off the feeling that something important is missing in cases like my attempted at trespass case. Now, I think that the problem here can be framed in terms of direction of fit. So, what happens in, in this case is that I change my will so as to make sure that your behavior doesn't wrong me. But this is not how things should go, ideally. Ideally, it should be the other way around. Ideally, what we normally hope to do is to use consent as a way of guiding other people's behavior so that their behavior will not wrong us, rather than using consent as a way of adjusting our will to uh, uh, other people's uh, behavior so that their behavior doesn't wrong us. So the, the world, what happens in the world should ideally conform to what our will is, rather than our will conforming to what the world is going to be like. So ideally we want our consent to determine how others behave toward us and not vice versa. So what does it take for the recipient of consent to be guided by the exercise of our power to consent? What well, two things. First, the consenter must intend to change the normative the relationship with the recipient of consent so that the former is no longer wrong when the latter acts in certain ways. Second, the normative, in order for the normative relationship to be changed in the right way, the recipient's behavior must be sensitive to the presence of that very intention. And this kind of sensitivity, sensitivity to the intention of the consenter, is what's missing from my trespass case. And this problem is an instance of a more general problem. So a case that is often discussed in the literature is a case like, um, you know, suppose I, at the beginning of this seminar, I say, you know, anyone attending the seminar is, wel is welcome to use my laptop. Uh, and then suppose Andrew arrives late for the seminar. He doesn't know that I said that, that I gave that permission. And then he takes my laptop anyway, and then he starts, he starts tapping on the laptop. Um, if the mental state view is correct, we would have to say that, if the traditional mental state view is correct, we would have to say that he did have my permission, he was acting uh, with my consent. But even if we believe that, and I tend to believe that, there is something which is missing, which is that his decision to take my laptop was not sensitive to my intention to let him use my laptop. He didn't care to check whether I, whether I had consented to, use, to him using my laptop, which suggests that he would have used my laptop even if I had not consented. But if the value of having the power to consent is explained by the fact that it enables us to have control over the duties that other people owe us, then we should care not only that people enter our house with our consent or use our laptop with our consent, we should also care that they would not have entered our house or they would not have used our laptop without our consent. We should care that our control over our normative relationship with them is not a matter of luck. So, once again, I think this is captured by this idea that 
The normative relationship between the consenter and the, and the intended recipient of consent must be changed in the right way. So the intended, intended recipient of consent must acknowledge the, int the intention of the consenter so that that intention can play the right role in the practical deliberation of the, of the recipient of consent. And a view that gives people permission to enter our house is irrespective of whether they uh, have taken into consideration our intention to change our normative relationship with them is one that does a worse job at protecting our autonomy than a view that makes the permission conditional on um, the recipient trying to track our intention. So if we think that the value of consent is that it protects our autonomy, it looks as if a view that makes um, uh, conduct permissible, irrespective of whether the recipient of consent is trying to track our intention, does a worse job in protecting our autonomy. And I think that it's something like this view that is motivating people who are drawn toward the mixed view. But I don't think that we need to go all the way um, and accept the communicative view in order to preserve this aspect of the, of, of, you know, to, to vindicate this, uh, this idea, namely the idea that the intended recipient of consent should be sensitive to our uh, intentions or to our mental state or to what we want, uh, how we want to change our normative relationship with them. And I think that the reason why defenders of the, of the mixed view tend to think that, tend to think that we need to accept the, their view, is that the focus in the debate so far has been exclusively on what the consenter should do in order for consent to be validly given. Should the consent form a mental state or should she um, attempt to communicate this mental state or should she successfully communicate this mental state? I think that this is a mistake. We shouldn't focus exclusively on what the consenter does. We should also look at what the recipient of consent does. So this is my this is really my suggestion. Um, in addressing the question of the ontology of consent, we should focus on what the consenter as well as on what the recipient of consent um, uh, does. So perhaps at least in the ideal case, the recipient of consent must act in certain ways in order for consent to be valid. Should the, the the recipient of consent should at least try to respond, should at least try to track the intention of the consenter. So think about just, you know, this is, think about a, a, a famous problem in epistemology. Think about what it takes to have knowledge. Having justified true belief by accident doesn't count as knowledge. So, you know, if you, if you, Check your, your watch, this is a famous example. Check your watch, um, you see it's a uh, uh, quarter to six. Um, in fact, it is a quarter to six because the watch stopped uh, working exactly yesterday at the same time. What you have is not knowledge, you have a, um, um, we have to justify belief, but you don't have knowledge because in order to have knowledge, uh, no, the you have true sorry, you have true belief, but you don't have uh, you don't have knowledge because in order to have uh, knowledge, the process through which you acquire um, uh, justify uh, true belief should um, uh, should be modally robust, should uh, um, deliver justified true beliefs across a range of counterfactual scenarios. So it has to be the case that you get the right time if you check the uh, watch in five minutes, or if you had checked it five minutes uh, ago. So, I think similarly, perhaps we should say that when the recipient of consent does not try to track the intention of the consenter, as in my trespass case, we have something that falls short of consensual behavior. Another question is, what is that? Um, so, this is, the, this is the question I'm interested in considering. I, 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 don't have a, I don't have a clear view. So, it seems to me that Whereas in cases my, whereas I think we, we should say that I have given consent in my attempted trespass case, um, 
I think those are genuine cases of consent, but they seem to be cases of defective consent. And so what I'm interested in is considering these two notions, the, the ideal case of consent, whether, where there is this attempt to track the intention of the consenter, and cases of defective consent, when, where this uh, attempt to track the intention of the consenter is missing. It seems to me that in cases of uh, defective consent, although a permission has been created, some sort of compensation or apology, some sort of remainder still uh, is, is called for. And so this is, this is the idea that I want to explore further. So the two main points that I want to, that, that, that I, uh, that I want to present is first, we cannot adequately address the question of the ontology of consent without connecting it to the question of the justification of consent. Um, and so, and then second, in answering the question of the ontology of consent, we shouldn't focus exclusively on what the consenter does, we should also focus on what the intended receiving the consent does. And I think that these two move, uh, push us toward the mental state view my discussion of what it takes to revoke consent, and my discussion of um, views based on the, uh, uh, on the idea that we consent when we attempt to uh, communicate consent also, I think, reinforce this conclusion. So, I'll stop here.